Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moment, moments away, Joe Lampo will be with us. But first, you got Japanese beetles flying around. We got a product from Rescue that can uh, get them under control and eliminate them. Yep, Japanese beetle traps, when used properly, draw beetles away from your plants and trees. The trick is to hang, hang them 30 feet from plants you want to protect. That way you can lure the beetles away from the areas where they cause damage and trap them. Rescue Japanese beetle traps are only traps with controlled release lure that last the entire beetle season. Their extra large bag is welded directly to the trap and stays put even when it's full of beetles. And Rescue Japanese beetle traps are the only trap with a reusable bag that opens and closes at the bottom. It, during beetle, If the beetle season is a bad one, you just open, empty, keep trapping the beetles with the same trap. You can find all this information at rescue.com. It's made in the USA. Again, that's rescue.com. Uh, Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Joel Ample is not only an experienced gardener, but an author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. Welcome to the program, Joel. Hey, Holly. Thank you. Well, Joe, we thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start off with some tomato problems. You experienced uh, a couple of issues recently with your tomato patch, and why don't you share that story with you and how you figured out the diagnostics of what the issue was? Yeah, boy, I'll tell you, no two years are the same, right? So um, I started noticing wilt on one of my plants that had grown really well, was producing a lot of tomatoes, and then suddenly... It just started wilting, and I was scratching my head about it because I'm aware of soil-borne diseases that can cause wilt, such as verticillium or fusarium or southern blight. But as I was watering at the base of the plant with my watering wand, which I often do because I enjoy hand watering, and it gives me a chance to stare my plant down and notice any changes. But I was putting pressure on the soil with the end of my watering wand, and the watering wand was just easily going into the soil whereas you know normally you would think it would just stop at the base and stop but it was like sinking in and then i was watching the soil and it was like imploding around my plant and i'm like what the and so the more i pushed the wand into the soil the easier it was for the wand to continue to go and penetrate deeper into my raised beds which are 18 inches and i thought something's not right here and i pretty much knew right away at that point, what it was, because I'd seen mole tunnels between my beds, which only told me that they were probably burrowing underneath the, the wood to get into the all-you-can-eat buffet of worms in my soil. And so, you know, it's like submarines in the ocean that are, you know, about to fire these, these, these um, torpedoes that are going to take out whatever their target is. And in my case, the, tor the submarines were the moles and the torpedoes were just there gnawing through the roots and eating the worms and make wreaking havoc underground in that soil food web. And it was really wreaking havoc on my plants. And so uh, that's what happened. And I kept watering, hoping that I would get some recovery and the roots would re regenerate and so forth. But in the case of a couple plants, that just never happened. So I haven't taken them out yet because I haven't had the heart to do it, but I'm ready to throw in the towel on those. And then on the other ones that I had, Will, that's Southern Blight, which is a bacterial disease that uh, is soil-borne. And it comes from just a buildup over time of, you know, planting the same family in the same location too many years in a row. And I raised my hand to that as being guilty because – I love growing tomatoes and I don't have an unlimited space to do it. So I defy the odds or think I can and put the same plants in the same location year after year. And sure enough, it comes in and bites me. And um, now I'm dealing with plants that can't survive certain certain varieties of tomatoes that aren't aren't weathering the storm. So I'm experimenting right now, pulling those out and putting different varieties in back in place. It's too early to tell if they're going to survive or not. But um, it's so frustrating because these are things that you can't see above ground. You can't do anything about it. And you just watch it happen before your eyes. And, you know, when you have high expectations and you, you keep a bar very high and those kind of things happen, it's humbling. And it reminds you that Mother Nature is totally in charge and you, you know, you have to just stay on your toes. Now, two questions in regards to that. One, how many years 
do you feel or do you know it's safe to plant the tomatoes in the same spot? And then with a problem such as this, do you take that and turn that into a teaching lesson for the, the television show? Yeah. I say first part of your question, I'd say two years, three years max before you start the, the, the uh, pathogens start to build up in excess to the point that, you know, you're not going to get away from it. It's just a matter of time, Joey. And then um, any, anything that I do is a teachable moment. Uh, you know, it's great to showcase all the successes, but where I really feel we all learn is through our challenges, our learning opportunities. Some people call them failures. I look at everything as a chance to learn more and improve upon it. And so if I can have those learning opportunities like anyone else, all the better because I'm in a I'm in a, a position of high exposure. And so a lot of people can learn from my mistakes and I'm happy. I'm happy to make them on their behalf, you know, because if I can share what I discovered and how I learned what I learned and how to correct it or make improvements, all the better. And, you know, I don't I don't have an ego such that I'm a beyond, you know, sharing what I'm learning, too. We're all in this together. And the thing is, we're all making mistakes or, you know, these opportunities. And as long as we share what we observed and what we're trying to do to fix it, and especially if we do figure it out all the better. I mean, we all need to do that more often. You know, we need to let our pride go and again, remember that we're not in charge and just um, we're always learning. And to me, that's one of the most fascinating and most inspiring parts of gardening is that the unlimited opportunities to learn, you never run out of those. And it just makes us better. Every time we encounter something like that, it just makes us stronger and better and more confident in, in going forward. So I'm all for sharing those instances anytime I encounter them. And and from a product, pr- production standpoint, you know, 20, 20 years ago in the mid-90s, you know, w- with people who had gardening shows, they didn't show failures because they had X amount of minutes to make something happen and make it look wonderful, and that was it. That whole mindset has changed now that, hey, here's what I did, here's what I did wrong, so you don't do that. Joey, that is such a great thing that you just said, because I can tell you, going back to my first television show on as a gardening host for DIY Network, before I ever went on camera for the first day, I had a pre-production meeting with my producer, and she sat me down, and probably the very first thing she said, I'll never forget it, but I think it was like the first thing she said, and she said this, she said, let me just make it clear, failure is not an option, <laughs> and I'm like, you're not a gardener, <laughs> I mean, how is that possible? And, and, you know, in three years, we really only did have about one or two failures, but I advocated for sharing that with, uh, with the audience and the DIY network executives agreed with me. They embraced it and it was the best thing we ever did. That's amazing. Um, so some, some part of the countries are in a drought. Some of us have too much rain. Some of us are finally getting the rain we need. And, um, what are your best watering tips to, have the the best watering season throughout the season work on your soil create soil that drains well when you get too much rain it's draining well but when you add organic matter and you have you know humus in there and you have um particulates that can hold on to water particles then the water is going to be available to the plants in times of drought so you have the best of both worlds and and all you really need to do at the core is focus on building healthy soil. And if you can do that, you're going to have soil that's going to drain well, and yet it's going to hold moisture. And then in addition to that, above ground, you're setting up your watering system so that they are sort of on autopilot, such as with drip irrigation or soaker hoses on timers, so that, you know, on average every week, you've got it dialed in to provide, let's just call it an inch of water over a week. And, um, and that really does it. And I got to tell you, Holly, there's very little times where I need to go out and supplement my watering. But you also have to take into consideration what you're planting into. For example, are you planting in ground? Are you planting in raised beds? Are you doing grow bags or straw bales? Because depending on what you're planting in, there are greater needs, such as with containers or grow bags. Probably you need to water every day, but not in a large raised bed and certainly not in ground. But that's part of the process of learning your environment and adapting and being a thinking gardener, you know, uh, applying what you're observing and making those corrections and adjustments to appropriately deliver that water. 
Absolutely. Now with your program, Growing a Greener World, check your local PBS station for time and availability in your area. What is uh, a, a memorable or unique uh, moment that you have had on a recent episode of Growing a Greener World? Um, I think uh, the one that just jumps out at me when you said that, when you refer- referenced recently, was just just being reminded of the joy of gardening. There was a couple that ironically, you know, we traveled the country to tell these stories and there was a couple that lives literally less than two miles from me down the road. And I discovered them because they had a sign stuck on the street that said plant sale. And I was running some errands and I saw the sign. I said, what the heck? I'll go check it out. I have plenty of plants, but I'm always interested. And it turned, I, I came into a neighborhood I'd never been into before just down the street pulled in pulled along the street and there were lots of cars there and i walked upon their their garden it was amazing this huge beautiful food garden in their front yard followed by this wonderful native woodland garden in their backyard and water ponds and just on top of the beauty and the serenity of this garden the couple the husband and wife the love that they had for each other and the passion they had for gardening and the joy that they got by doing it together. They were soulmates and they were gardening partners for over 40 years. And, and the, the feeling you got from being around them or even just watching the show, because it was the most watched show we ever did for our past season, season 11, by far, the comments have come in from around the world, but it, their, their story translated and, and, you know, having been there and spent time with them and getting to know them, when we watched the show, we edited it and we put it out there we didn't feel like it translated like we had seen it firsthand because I don't think you can really translate that truly through broadcast. But apparently we were successful enough at it that it really resonated with many, many people that watched it because they got it. But it just, it just, I think it was a message of showing the joy that one person or two people together can have with gardening And, you know, when you have that person that you can do that with, that shares that passion with you, it just makes it all the better. And it was a wonderful reminder. And we've become good, close, fast friends. And we spend time a lot together. But it was one of the highlights of my career filming television was just meeting this couple in a serendipitous moment of a plant sale sign. And it turned into a strong friendship and a real admiration for this couple that has is so passionate for gardening and and the love that they have for each other and it was just a great story and a it just epitomized what i love trying to find for those stories we tell on growing a greener world and you travel all over north america and halfway around the world and you went two miles and there it was i know i know that's what cracks me up and thank god you know joey the ironic thing was thank this was during covid right because we couldn't travel and yet one of the best shows we ever did was because of COVID, we're at home, and here it was two miles down the road. Never would have house. happened otherwise. Right, exactly. Well, let's talk about raised beds. You grow in raised beds. How does one uh, feed the raised bed or keep the soil productive year after year? What's the key there? The key is to amend it with organic matter, namely compost, once or twice a year, as I do between the growing season. So coming out of my cool season and the late spring coming into summer, uh, when the when the beds, I clean out my my crops that are kind of on the tail end, my brassicas and my cool season crops to make room for the summer crops. And while I have that blank slate, I go ahead and top dress with about an inch of compost. And a lot of times I'll use a broad fork and I'll open up some space in the soil. That's not tilling. It's just opening up a little bit of space in the soil. The compost makes its way down a little bit deeper. And then I plant my uh, warm crops and vice versa at the end of the warm season crops the garden gets cleaned out again for my cool season. So I repeat the top dressing, soil amending, composting a couple times a year. But even if you did it once, that's great because there's so much in compost that money can't buy. The microbiology, the nutrients, the microbes, all of those things that work symbiotically in the soil to feed the plant. So you're, you're amending the soil, so you're feeding the soil and then the soil is taking care of feeding the plants by providing soluble based food that the roots can access as needed because you have created that environment for the soil 
biota to go to work and make that happen. So it's not so much fertilizer, Joey. It's not like feeding the plants with synthetic fertilizer. You're feeding the soil with what nature intended for them to have that allows them to get the nutrients they need and the texture and the tilth and the drainage and the and the moisture retention. All of those things happens because you just focus on good organic matter, namely compost. Now, do you feed your plants with an organic fertilizer or do you rely on that compost to do that feeding? Yeah. For the most part, I rely on the compost, but but about every two weeks during the most active time of the growing season, I do supplement it with a, a, a fish emulsion, basically, uh, in the first month i'll do a like a 511 ratio nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium and then as we go into flower and fruiting i switch over to another fish based product which is basically a 231 ratio where a little more emphasis on phosphorus to develop the flower and the fruit and you know i'm i don't do that a lot just you know two weeks every two weeks at the most but you know a lot of what i'm growing are very heavy feeders and the, the tomatoes that i'm growing so they really benefit from that and they show it so um that's what i do but then i get into the fall garden and i really never fertilize it i rely on the compost and those plants could not be more productive or more healthy or more beautiful and i'm not doing anything in addition to just building the soil that's really that's really great helpful advice so we really enjoyed having you on on the show um how can people find out more about you and all of your great wonderful gardening information joegardener.com is is the place where you could probably find everything else you need to know we link to a lot from the main website and then my instagram handle is at joegardener and i'm active there and so those are a couple good places to find me yeah, and then the Joe Gardener Show podcast. And, and, and the uh, Instagram, you do a lot of uh, videos and take, you know, straight out in the garden and people have questions and you, you try to answer them right there on the spot. So very interactive. Thank you. It's all real, man. There's no fluff. It's just who <laughs> yeah. I am. And I, I share I share my mistakes as well as my wins. And, and that that's uh, a big, big benefit in today's society is to show those mistakes uh, because not everybody... People, the, the 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 mindset of oh I, I never make a mistake uh, doesn't make people look too good. Nope, that is not authentic, and uh, you know we don't need that. That doesn't help anybody. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate the time you've given us. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and educating not only Holly and myself but all of our listeners. My pleasure, you two. Take care, and and I look forward to catching up again later. Absolutely. Thank you. For more information, please visit the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com.